welcoming everyone to our, our Sunday service at Rehoboth Church. Our website is rehobothchurch.us. Welcoming all those who are on our live stream. And we are continuing our series titled, Let Us Rise Up and Build. Turn with me to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. I'll be reading from verse 5 where we left. And, I, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, great and terrible, that keeps covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandment. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes be opened that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night for children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee both I and my father's house have sinned we have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor judgments which thou commanded by thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If he transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if he turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet I will gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. May the Lord bless the hearing and the reading of his word. We continue with our teaching that we began uh, three weeks back, and right now we are in that section where Nehemiah is praying unto the Lord God of heaven. We last time looked at the three aspects of those the prayer. First is he agonized before God, he ascribed unto God, and he spoke of the awesomeness of God. To this, uh, this morning we are going to look at uh, two major aspects. One, he acknowledged before God and the second is he appealed to God. You know, before I go further into it, I want to bring a very important mention that Nehemiah almost prayed for 120 days. Though it is not recorded in the Bible, yet there is an implication that it was almost 120 days because from the month of Kislu to the month of Nisan when he met the king are almost four months because there is also an implication that he was praying night and day. Imagine a man of God who goes not quickly to fix a problem, but he goes to the Lord in prayer. You know, no matter what we are confronted with, I want to tell you that prayer is powerful. What you are faced with is going to be broken down through the power of prayer. Prayer is the appropriate re response for Lord's blessings, and we verbalize God's plan for us. God God expects us to verbalize what he has spoken in his word. This is a, such a privilege we have in prayer. The great man of God who was a missionary to Punjab, oh, Edward Bounds, said like this, it's a privilege to have audience with the king of kings. Many a times the church and the people of God has trivialized the power and the glory that is released through prayer. Yeah. And sometimes it feels like it's almost like a mundane duty. Beloved, the results that are wrought through prayer are unimaginable. The devil in our soulish man makes us tired and weary that we never ever pray. But I tell you something, as we continue in prayer, the, the walls that have fallen down are going to be built. The Lord uses his people to be wall builders. Your prayers are like wall that 
it will garrison around you, your household, and everything that concerns you. So learn to pray. And Nehemiah knew how to pray. The first aspect that we see over here is that he acknowledged before God. The structure of our prayer are founded on God's covenant. What I mean to say is there is a foundation in the prayers that we pray. It is not baseless. It is based on what God has said. You can always approach to God based on his covenant. Before I go into the depth of this, let me speak to you what does that mean. Covenant is an agreement between two parties that is binding God also has made some covenants in the Bible. The first one in the Garden of Eden after man fell in sin where he made a coat of skin. A sacrifice was done in order to restore and give him a covering. And this promise was given that Jesus will come into this world. Again, God made a covenant with Noah that I will bless your generation. And as he stepped into building the ark and as he came out of the ark the Lord gave him a token of that covenant in the rainbow that I am not going to destroy the world then we see another man named Abraham that God told him that I am going to make a covenant I will bless your generation your children shall be like the stars in the sky and like the sand in the sea and those who bless you I will bless and those who curse I will curse no wonder why is Israel is a tiny nation among all the Middle Eastern nations, yet none of them have the power and the strength. The Bible says not even a dog will lift up his tongue against the people of God. That powerful is this covenant because this covenant is not based on my merit or your merit. This covenant is based on the merit of God. <coughs> the Bible says that... That he is the one who keeps his covenant. We need to understand the greatness of this covenant rests on the character of God. See, that is the thing. When we approach God, we come with all purity and all clarity about what God speaks in his word. He is an honest judge God, a just God. If he has said something, he will fulfill in our lives. The uniqueness of this covenant is based on the truths of God's word. The First thing is that God does not lie. There are three places in the Bible where there is very specifically it is mentioned that God does not lie. The first time it is mentioned is in Numbers 23, 19. Now you have to understand something. This word was not spoken by a person of Jewish descent. This word was spoken by someone who was on the way to curse the people of God. He was sent by King Balak and his name was Prophet Balaam. He was a hired prophet and King Balak wanted to curse because this, was, this nation was such a huge nation. They were a threat to these people. While in wilderness yet never possessing their own land were a threat to the Moabite nation who had their own geography and kingdom. That's the kind of goddess. You may not have a place. You may not have people yet you are a threat to the people because you carry a covenant and lo and behold this is what God puts in the mouth of one who comes to curse that God is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent that he said shall he not do it or has he spoken shall he not make it good Watch what the Lord does. That's the sense of humor. You may not have everything, yet you are powerful because you possess the covenant. Uh, the second time this word that God does not lie is used in the book of Titus where Paul says like this, in the hope of eternal life that God cannot lie, promised before the world began. I mean before this world was said, let there be God's 
said, I am going to give you eternal life. There was a council in heaven where God decided no matter what man falls in sin, there is a plan. The beautiful plan was unveiled on that dark night, on that dark evening, on the cross. The darkest hour was the finest hour when the fury and the, and the anger of God was in its fiercest force. In its, it was the finest hour of human history because God took the sin of man. God died and God cannot die. A miracle that no man can imagine was birthed on the Mount of Calvary. It took 6,000 years, yet God fulfilled it. We have been waiting on some promises. It has taken a while, but beloved, the one who has promised, he will do it in his time. The third time that the Bible says God does not lie is in Hebrews 6, 18. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. You know, now that word goes to a higher level. Paul uses double negatives. For it was impossible. Impossible is a negative. God could not lie. That is another negative. When two negatives are used in the Bible, it is absolutely emphatic. It means there is no way, no way, no way, no power in this world can stop from fulfilling God's plan in our life. That we might have a strong consolation, we have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. See, that is what God does. So the beauty of this covenant is God keeps the covenant because God does not lie. So Nehemiah held on to that truth. He had a revelation. When you pray, pray with revelation. Not only God does not lie, God does not change his mind. For I am God, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. I mean, if God has spoken, he will never change. If he has spoken his covenant, I am going to restore these people. I will do it. Nehemiah based this prayer on what God spoke. Base your prayers on what God spoke because that truth is irrefutable and irrevocable. Psalms 89 verse 34 says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing which is gone out of my lips. God promises that he will never break his covenant and Nehemiah knew it and he knew it. If I would tap into the covenant of God, for sure God will honor my prayer. You want God to honor your prayer? Pray some of these prayers. You can know never, ever, never, ever, oh God will back out on what he has said. It may tarry for a time, yet in the due time, oh the one who shall come, shall come may tarry but in the due time he may not he will not delay in his promises God's delays are better than man's haste God remembers his covenant he is not like some of us who promise things and forget, oh, I forgot that. No, 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 no. He remembers what he has spoken. He's intentional. And that's what Nehemiah said. Oh, God, you remember your covenant. God heard their groanings and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's in book of Exodus when they were being persecuted by Pharaoh. He remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generation, which covered the, uh, which he made covenant with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for 
an everlasting covenant. What it says over here, he remembers his covenant. He keeps it to a thousand generations. You, your children, your children's children, and the children's children. That's the promise the Lord says. My covenant shall be on your tongue and on your children's tongue and on your children's children forever and ever. It's an eternal everlasting covenant that God has promised to his people. God does not lie. God does not change. God remembers his covenant. God keeps his covenant. I mean God guards his covenant. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12, he watches over the word he performs, which means he's garrisoning around, which means like, a, like soldiers around a city, the Lord camps around the word he speaks. He speaks healing to your child. He speaks that your child will be blessed at this moment you might be seeing things not in conducive may not feel like where the direction is but the Lord is watching over the Lord says this word will come to a pass in Jesus name Lord will establish his work in this city through us you watch and see no power no demon will stand against it or oh, no matter who rises God will move among us like a mighty force watch and see what the Lord will do among us God keeps his covenant. No power can come against that. Then Nehemiah said something. After he reminded about the covenant, he said, Lord, you remember your servants who observe your commandments. God will honor obedience. Don't go to prayer without being obedient. If God commands you to do something, do it. Don't pray without obedience because that prayer is not going to be answered. Let me be very candid over here. I'm not going to sugarcoat. Let me tell, if you have done something wrong, ask the Lord for forgiveness. Make things right and go to the Lord in prayer. God is going to honor that. The Lord honors the obedience. The Bible says, Lord, let now your eyes be attentive and your ears to the prayer of your people. Please let your ears be attentive and your eyes be open that you may hear the prayer of your servant. Solomon was dedicating the temple. And as Solomon was dedicating the temple, he prayed a prayer like this in this manner. Now, my God, I let, I beseech thee, thine eyes be open and let thine ears be attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. And this is how God responded back in Second Chronicles chapter 7. Now my eyes shall be open and my ears unto the prayer that is made in this place. I mean the Lord says, if you ask you, my eyes and ears be open. Yes, his eyes and ears are listening to your prayer. That's the kind of prayer Nehemiah prayed because he knew you, the fathers, prayed those kinds of prayers and God answered those prayers. He honors our obedience. He's attentive, his eyes are attentive and his ears are attentive to our prayers. He acknowledges the confession of our sins. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of children of Israel which we have sinned against you. He verbalized that, Lord, we have committed sin against you. Both my father's house have, and have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded by your servant Moses. The greater part of Nehemiah's prayer was confession. When you come to God in prayer, come with confession. Come with a sense of repentance before God. The power of prayer is hidden in the fact that you come with brokenness and repentance before God. You know what is repentance? Repentance is a change of heart. 
Now, when I say that word, a change of heart, does not mean just with a lip service, it should be tangibly seen. Let me explain what does that mean. It means that we bring the fruit of salvation. What is fruit of salvation? Fruit of salvation is that the things that I used to do, the cuss words that I used to use, the abuses that I used to do, the anger that I had, the things that I watched, the things that I said, the things that I carried inside. But the moment Christ came inside of me, I have no part in that. I make a decision. It is the conversion of what Zacchaeus had. Oh, they were all pointing and saying, he's a sinner. But Zacchaeus said, Lord, oh, I will give half of my how my my give my my estate to the poor and if i have taken anything unjustly four times i will return it back this day salvation has come so repentance involves action you might ask a question why because faith without works is dead like a spirit without a body is dead our faith should have manifestation of work. It is the fruit of salvation and not the root of the salvation. There should be fruits. So there was a repentance in Nehemiah and there was confession before God. See, the major part of his prayer was, Oh Lord, we are sorry. We have done things wrong. We have did things that were not supposed to be. You know what? God is pleased because we are now stepping into a place where God's heart is being cooled. He, his anger is being cooled down because he sees people are acknowledging what they have done and they are taking actions. Now when he did it, he had a secret to do it. I'll explain you what. He knew the word of God. When you go to prayer, you need to know how you are praying. Many times we can pray useless prayers which are not really hitting the target. Sorry, I word the word useless. What I mean to say is it's not hitting the target because we are beating around the bush. It should be like a sharp shooter direct into the goal, not going around in that. It should just go direct into where we have aimed. It should be targeted prayers. You know why his prayer was targeted? Because there is something that is mentioned in Leviticus. Let me read it for you. Ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' land, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If they shall confess, watch that word their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers. That's what he said. Me and my fathers. I mean, he did not directly commit sin, yet taking the sin. When we pray for our families, when we pray for our nation and our church, we may not have directly been a part of that, yet when we take responsibility, God likes people who own responsibility. He likes those who are accountable and responsible. He said, oh God, oh Lord, if we have confessed their iniquity with their trespasses, which they have trespassed against me, that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that also I have walked contrary with them, unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts humbled, then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant. Hallelujah. He knew the word. Because God says in Leviticus, if they will repent... I will remember the covenant. Now here's the thing. This is the same meaning and theology throughout the pages of the Bible. If we have lived in a place of sin and when we repent, God will return back to us. He's merciful. And then I will remember the covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. And I will remember the land. He knew how to tap into the heart of God. 
He remembers his word. Oh, he said, remember, I pray thee, you commanded your servants, Moses, if we are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. If we return to me and keep my commandments, though we were cast out in the farthest part of the heaven, yet I will gather them there and bring them to the place which I have chosen. Hallelujah. There is a provision and there is a way in God. No matter how bad it looks like, no matter what the judgment is, you can, through prayer, push back darkness because God offers that gift of repentance and forgiveness. That's the power of prayer Nehemiah tapped into. He acknowledged the sins of his and his family and his whole nation before the Lord. After acknowledging that, he appealed to God. The humble prayer closed with confidence. When John writes his epistles, he says like this, this is the confidence we have. Hallelujah. That if we ask anything according to his will, praise God, this is in God's will. Whatever is in God's word is, is within the ambit of God's will. I will hear your prayer, hallelujah. According to this will, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have our petitions before him. See, these prayers have a certain protocol. You remember when you come before God and when you have done what the Lord has, His word has told you to do, your appeal is on His table. Hallelujah. We pray those kinds of prayer. We don't pray sheepish prayers. We don't pray covered prayers. We pray prayers where God moves. You know, that's what the power of this faith is. You know, the world says, you know, seeing is believing. But uh, the Bible says, believing is seeing. If you shall believe, you shall see the glory of God. Nehemiah's humble prayer closed with an expression of confidence. To begin with, he had confidence in the power of God. When the Bible speaks of the ears and eyes of the Lord, it is using only human language to describe the divine activity. God is spirit, therefore does not have a body such as humans, but he is able to see his people's needs and hear them prayers and work on their behalf with his mighty hand and Nehemiah knew he was too weak to rebuild Jerusalem see the see one of the things you will notice about Nehemiah's prayer was he knew his weakness he knew his inability he never showed pride when he appealed there were certain protocols he met uh, he he followed, he appealed in humility. The word says, now thy servants. I mean, he did not, he, did, he said, Lord, I am not worthy, Lord, though we have inheritance, yet calling himself servants. Though they had the inheritance, yet called himself servant coming in humility. Humble yourself in the mighty hands of God. He will lift you up in due time. One of the secrets of his prayer was appealed in humility. Not only appealed in humility, he appealed in honor. The Bible says, O Lord God, I beseech thee, O great power, and by thy strong hand. You know, he gave honor unto God. Give glory and honor unto God. That is due. When you give him the honor, you watch and see God begins to work. There's a story in the Bible where centurion said, oh master, I am not worthy for you to come into my house. You just say a word. He honored the authority of Jesus. Nehemiah honored the authority of Lord God. When we have honor, we come to this with this appeal in honor. God honors us. He appealed in the fear of God. He said, your servants who fear your name. Now, there are two kinds of fear in the Bible. One fear is the fear of man. 
That's the satanic fear. False evidence appearing real. That's why David says in Psalms 23, I will fear no evil. There is another fear where you reverentially acknowledge the presence of God in your life. You know God's presence in your life. You walk uprightly and in integrity of your heart. You don't choose to walk in anything that is unholy. He knew the fear of God. You know, fear of God opens the doorway to the presence of God. You might ask how that is, Pastor. Here's the key. Every moment. Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the noontime. Jesus in the evening. Jesus in the night. Jesus in the dawn. I mean... I only think about Jesus. I, in my night watches, I only meditate him. I don't put any other garbages into my heart, which means I am walking in this understanding. When I step out of my house onto the driveway to get into the car, Jesus. When I'm by myself, Jesus. When I'm in the store, Jesus. When I'm with somebody, Jesus. I mean... I cannot even trust my own heart. Therefore, I have had him inside. And as one learns to walk like that, you will be like Enoch. The Bible says, Enoch walked with God. Oh, the Lord is calling to a realm. Not just communion. People are good with communion and habitation. The Lord says, come to a place of consummation. You have let Jesus only in the living room. And then possibly into the dining room. But Jesus calls you, come on, let me take over the bedroom also. That's why David says, in my night watches, my heart communes with you, Lord. A place of con consummation. Oh, a place where I've completely surrendered to God. He appealed for a favorable answer. There was a sharp shooting. He said, prosperous. He first, he did not present all those problems. He confessed. Then there was an order. This is a very powerful prayer. Though it is in the Old Testament, yet it is very relevant for the New Testament times we are living in. There is a pattern that you see. Paul says, first of all, intercessions and supplications. Oh, there is a very special power in this prayer because you are having audience with the King of Kings. Oh, he appealed for mercy. He appealed knowing God could change, the, change the, everything because he said one more thing he did. He did not put King Xerxes in the same pedestal with God Almighty. You watch one thing. Grant mercy before this man. What Nehemiah said is, yes, he's a king, yet he is no match to the God of gods. He acknowledged God, oh, higher and higher than this man. He is mere mortal. See, when we pray, we should pray with that mindset. I mean, give authority, honor to people. That's a different thing. Their honor should not go above God's. God, what's that? You know why? Because in Proverbs 21, there is a very good verse. The heart of the king is in the Lord's hand. He turns it like a water course. I mean, when this prayer was being made, the Lord began to move things. This is a recent testimony. I was praying with a brother in India through the night for almost... Four months, churches have not been opened. I said, brother, that is not right. Churches need to be opened. I don't care there is COVID because this is devil's plan that we don't worship because worship is our battle cry. When we worship, devil runs for money. He doesn't want us to worship. So, brother, we need to take a stand. We need to pray and open the churches. I told him, go and get a lock, go and get a key. Let's anoint. Let's pray in the spirit. Let's unlock the churches now. We began to pray. Praise God. Yesterday, his church opened. All the churches are opening up. Hallelujah. Oh, the decree was from the government. Nothing will be open. They let the liquor shops open. They let the cinema theaters open, but not the church. But church needs to open. People of God need to pray, hallelujah. They need to know the authority of the king and the authority of the king of kings. 
He appealed acknowledging his human position. For I was a king's cup bearer. Oh, yes, Lord, I'm a king's cup bearer. This is my position. But Lord, I am not taking any credit for it. I need your favor. I need your recommendation, not the recommendation of the king. You can be working in the White House. You can be working in the parliament. But sometimes recommendations from heaven work better than the recommendations of this world. Can we pray like Nehemiah prayed? Next week we are looking at how God grants favor before the king. Hallelujah. God is about to change certain things. He is going to change the laws that the enemy is making against the people of God. Will the church do some business? God says, I am intentional. If you will pray, then I will do it. Church is, rather than doing a lot of talking, church, it's time to pray. Brothers and sisters, it's time to pray. Quit worrying about all these things. You gather together and pray. You watch and see. We will push back darkness from this nation. Hallelujah. A revival is hitting the if we're hitting this, the shores of America. If you have not placed your trust in Jesus Christ, I would like to offer this and want you to consider this. You know what? When you open your mouth, you stand before holy God. Who can get such an audience? You will have the highest recommendation and favor. But here's the thing that's only possible when you repent of your sins, which means you turn away from the way you live your life, which means that you walk away from wickedness and the sinful things you did. You drop down that alcohol, that cigarettes, oh, that's drug, that bad habit. You might say, oh, nicotine is my, in my blood. Don't worry about that. Now Jesus is getting into your blood. When Jesus gets into your blood, nicotine and the alcohol will automatically go away because, oh, you will say there's a new old default sitting. I always feel like drinking. No, 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 no. That default sitting is also being vanished and new programming is being done. The default setting is Jesus inside. Now the new setting is I am drinking the new wine. That's Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't need any more alcohol. Hallelujah. Oh, I had this habit for 20 years. Oh, brother, sister, you don't have to worry. Jesus in my blood. Oh, that will all go away. Oh, he will cleanse you. Oh, what about my liver and all my my organs. Oh, it will be healed instantaneously as if you never drank in your lifetime. That's what Jesus does. But here's the key. Drop the alcohol in the drain. Drop the cigarettes and pray a prayer of confession. Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm dropping all those things. Forgive my sins. Come into my heart. Change my story. I know you died on the cross. Make that step closer to God further from the enemy and further from the world. The things that I did, I did do no more. The places I walked, I walked no more. And the things I thought, I don't think anymore. Now I do things that are pleasing unto the Lord. May the Lord bless you. Write to us, robertchurch.us. And for those brothers and sisters, there is power in prayer. We can push any power in this world. You watch and see the power in this world. God doesn't lie. He is true to his word. May the Lord bless us with this word. Loving, gracious, heavenly Father, I pray this word will bring forth much fruit. And Lord, it will do great work in the days to come. Let us rise up and build, you build your work in this place. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.